what up, what up, what up? I'm your boy Jersey, and I'm back with another episode of Black Culture The Breakdown. <laughs> All right, so we on Black Productions today, okay? Yes! Just a slight bit delayed, but it's all right. We're here, and we got my boy Teron in the building. That's going to be giving us a breakdown on what he got going on and tapping in with everything black culture, black excellence. What up, what up, what up? How we feeling? What y'all drinking tonight? Make sure y'all get y'all cups. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to click this out right here. Bang, 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 bang. Boom. Yes? Yes! And we're going to share this live with everybody in our network. Let's get people to tap in with us. Let's get the conversations rolling, and let's tap in to get this knowledge. All right? So... Teron, are you on here, my brother? Let's get this conversation jumping, um, and then let's let's get the vibes rolling. How we feeling, everybody? So I'm having some coquito, all right? Some leftover coquito from Thanksgiving. So we about to vibe out tonight. But all right, let's let's get Teron on the live. All right, here we go. I see it. How we feeling, everybody? Feeling great. Here we go. Yo, how how do you how do you tell people to look at your Instagram live? What button do you push? Tell, tell, tell people if you click, there's an arrow. Do you see the arrow button? Yeah. So share that. So click on that. Okay. And then you're gonna see, see all the different people pop up. You can go ahead and tap them and just share it with people. Yeah. Oh, see, you learn something new every day. Right. You learn something new every day. Yes. That's the whole point. That's the whole point of learning right now. You learn something new every day. I'm going to tell you something. Instagram Live is cool, but it's stressful. Like, it's stressful to be on Instagram yeah. Live. Yeah. Now, and I'm live all the time, but because, and I'll tell you what makes it stressful, girls. Because you're afraid of how you're going to look yeah. in front of girls. Like, you want to look cool. Like, we're on Instagram Live. We're not cool. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yo, Instagram Live is definitely one of those things that you got to try to be cool, but it's like hard to be cool. So then it ends up just turning into whatever happens, happens. I mean, that's the thing, though. But every I, you realize so much of your decision making process in life really comes down to girls. That's if you're, of course, a heterosexual male. Like, that's what it comes down to. I can only imagine what it's like for any other type of sexuality. But how many times have you been driving? You're driving, and there's a, a beautiful woman walking on the sidewalk, and you get mad at the car next to you for blocking the beautiful woman. Like, you get all, mad. All the time. Well, I'm hearing you. Hey. So, on the train, yo, sometimes you get that's chuckle. It's like, yo, you see her, and then all of a sudden you blink, and she's gone like a ghost. You know? Exactly. And you have nothing else. You, you're only going to look. Like, you have no other intentions because you're a good person. You know what I'm saying? Like, And, and also, sometimes yeah. you just know. You look expensive. Like, I am I can only look. I'm going to look. It's going to be for two seconds, and then I'm going to go about my way. But that look is so important. Oh, man, the 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 stress of being alive is just stressful. Uh, my brother, welcome to the show, man. Yo, thank you for having me, my dude. Thank you so much. Of course, man. So first of all, tell the people who you are and what you do. Oh, for all of you who don't know, my name is Tehran. Uh, like the capital of Iran. I'm half black, half Persian, and my parents named me Tehran. I don't know why they would do that. They literally looked at me and were like, black and Persian, not enough oppression. Tehran, go. Like, why? Why add that much more stress to my life? I already have to deal with being a hetero cisgendered male, and on top of that, now I'm black and Persian, and my name is Tehran. It's a lot. It's a lot to deal with. But I try to deal with it each and every day in my comedy. So hi to everybody saying hi. Dynamite Chick, uh, Code Red. There's a lot of people in the chat just living their best lives, and I love it. Yeah. Melly Gold. Thank you so they, much, Isabel. They're in here to definitely show you love, man, and get to tap in with you. So let's bring it back to the beginning for the people that don't really know. How did you get into comedy, um, and how did you kind of get started in the game? So the concept of comedy is very interesting because a lot of people think of comedians as people who are funny and get on stage and they're just funny, as if it's a natural organic growth of or extension of their own funniness, but it's not. Mm. Comedy is, is a hustle. Comedy is a hustle much like the rap game. And it's not just a natural skill, but one that's practiced, tried and true, hard work, smart work, and all of the above. The way I got into comedy was a natural... Besides being funny, it was a natural extension of me always wanting to share my 
perceptions and opinions with the world. I, I was a very opinionated person growing up. I did a lot of research and wanted to have conversations. And that's what comedy is about. Comedy is about relatability, bringing people together, sharing your story. And from your story, people empathetically see their own. And so that's where comedy really started for me was me just realizing that I had to, I had to share my story with the world because I want the world to share their story with each other. That, and I got in legal trouble. So when you combine the two, when you combine the two, it became comedy was my path. Comedy became my path. Shout out to Anna Kinzel, too. Anna Kinzel's in the building. What up? Uh, so, yeah. Dope. So now, you said definitely a lot in there that I even want to touch base on. You said comedy is hard work. Um, like, now, how long have you been in the comedy game for? So I've been doing comedy specifically for 10 years. And that's from beginning of my journey till now. So it's been a whole decade coming right out of coming right out of college and law school, I went straight into comedy. And it is a hustle. I'll tell you the things that are hustle. Living in LA on its own is a hustle the same way that living in New York is a hustle. So if you're in a Connecticut, it's not the same. It's just not the same. Yeah, as much as I appreciate small towns, midtowns, and suburbs, just the hustle of the big city is a different component. It's something on its own. And so that's something that a lot of people don't realize. Like you being in New York, it just sounds like, oh, you live in New York. No, you have to live to live in New York. You understand? Absolutely. It's facts. Yeah. Now, like, yeah. you've been in the game for 10 years. What's the difference that you see like from the beginning of how you started to how the game has changed to what it is now, how, how has the hustle changed? Like, do well, you, the hustle. Do you feel like today's comedians work a little less harder than mm. the comedians of yesterday? It's interesting. I don't think they work less hard. I think they just work differently. So a lot of comedians, especially the older generations of comedians, they look down on a lot of comedians now because it seems like they're doing less work, they're doing less prep, and they're getting more stage time than they ever received, especially with the advent of social media. You can be social media popular and not actually be good. And that's something that a lot of people see. But I would say that being social media popular in itself is a form of hard work. And as you and I know, just getting followers, getting people to pay attention is not as easy as it sounds. Having people follow you is not, is not cake. It's not, oh, if you build it, they will come. You have to build it. You have to promote it. You have to have a reason. You have to invite them. You have to give them food. Yes. Facts. That's 100% facts. And, and in terms of like how you see the hustle is for you kind of crossing over from, because it's like I've, I've had like Rodney, Rodney Perry came on the show a couple of weeks Rodney's ago. Rodney's good people. And, and he's someone that I would consider like, you know, legendary status. He's been back, you know, from the, from the Michael Coulter came on the show too a couple, couple like last season. And that's what's up. One of the original kings to me. And I feel like they hustled, like you said, differently because they mm. actually really perfected their craft. Where now you can go on Instagram or make a video real quick and drop your phone by accident. That gets a million views. And now you're a comedian star. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, so it's a hundred percent, a hundred percent. So now how do you find that to play to your advantage? Now, are you against using social media to your advantage? I think it's just like any good rapper, right? So in the rap game, you feel a lot of the same heat from the old generation and the older generation of rappers towards the new generation of rap. However, it doesn't mean you don't have to be good. You can be good at your craft and good at social media. It doesn't take away from either way. People like Tony Baker and Ryan Davis are perfect examples of that. People who are amazing, amazing on social media, but they are amazing comedians as well. And then you see a lot of comedians like Jess Hilarious, who is working her way in. Her, she's putting in that work. So yes, she's big on social media, but she's putting in that work. And one day she'll be in that air of legendary as well. So I never knock anybody's hustle. I never knock anybody's hustle. Good for you. For you. Now, so what, what do you say to the the old heads that are definitely maybe feeling like, yo, it's not fair. You know what I'm saying? I've been doing this for 30 years and I don't even got 100,000 followers or whatever the case may be. What's what's the response to, the, to that type of energy? My, my response to that energy is, you're right. You're <laughs> right. 
good for you. Like, but that doesn't change anything. If anybody told you life was fair, then you would hate being black. And I'm saying that to black comedians. Like, you know, there was a time where there was any time you look back in the past, there's always going to be like, you're, the whole point is to open doors for the future, right? That's the whole, everyone's like, yeah. I'm opening doors. So why are you upset when people have been walking through those doors that you open? We respect it, right? So there was a sharecropper who used to be like complaining and then a slave, a former slave would be like, what? We had to work for nothing. At least you get some of what you're working for. You know, it's always going to be the, the older generation. But the truth is, if, if you're a lover, it doesn't matter what generation you come from. You're going to love the game. You're going to love, you're going to love the support and you're going to love what's coming out right now. Absolutely. So, you know, you've actually done quite a few things and, you know what I'm saying, I'm actually looking at, you know, some of your, your work here and you've done, you know, some films, Mall Dogs, Jimmy Vestwood, Fury and the Fist, with the, Glow, um, with the Golden Fleece. Like, talk to us about your projects and, like, how did you actually break into that? Let's go with it next. So when it comes to film projects, to be very honest, my comedy was in such a space that people were choosing me to be in their projects. I was in a movie directed by Dane Cook, where he was in it, as well as, uh, as, well as Seth Green, written by Dane Cook and Mo Abhat, who wrote this movie called American Typecast, which was winning a lot of awards coming right, right before COVID. It was winning a lot of awards and acclaim. Now, I was in that movie because of a relationship that I have with Dane Cook and Mo Abha. And that's another thing is your network is your net worth. And I know that in every hustle, every single hustle, yeah. people don't realize, especially in, in show business, it's not just show, it's show business. And it should be called business show. It should be called business show. There's more business to it than show. And like any business, it's about your connections. It's about who you network with. It's about who you know. These are the four elements. It's what you know, then who you know, then what you know again, and then who knows you. Okay. And those are things that you have to work for. Yeah. It's not just given. It doesn't matter who you are. A lot of people love to talk about nepotism as if people are just given things because so-and-so is their father or their mother or their cousin, which, by the way, of course plays a part. There's always going to be a lot of different levels of privilege. However, the truth is, when you turn on the NBA, you're not looking for Michael Jordan's kids because they're not in the NBA no matter who their father was. You have to still work hard to get in the game, right? And the same applies to Hollywood. You have to work hard to get in the game. And that work isn't just being on stage. It's all the little things that come with it. It's the same thing that yeah. got Allen Iverson sent to China. It's the practice. It's hitting every open mic. It's hitting stages as often as you can. It's being around your element and meeting and networking and, and uh, just gaining the, the confidence of the people and your peers. It's going through hate and trolls and online. Not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to respect you. They crucified Jesus. What do you think they're going to do to you? So the concept is dealing with all this stuff. And if it was easy, then everybody would do it. Because when you ask people, they'll be like, I want to be famous. What do you want to be? I want to be rich and famous. What do you want to be? I want to be rich and famous. Are you willing to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, one, two, three? Nah. So you don't want to be famous. You no. just wish you were rich and famous. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of time. It's a lot of patience. It's a lot of rejection. It's a lot of failure. And the outcome you hope is success. Come on. You know what, well, we can just start to pack up the show now because you just killed it. Uh, you know what, like, bro, in terms of, you said so much, and there's a lot to even dive into when it comes to that. What do you say to people that be, I'm like, yo, I'm mad talented. This is what I'm born to do, but I don't want to be on social media. I don't want to go to industry events. I don't want to deal with these people. Everybody's fake. I'm tired of this industry shit. I just want to do my jokes. I just want to, you know, be an actor, whatever the case may be. What's your response to those people that just take the craft so seriously that they don't see nothing else? I respect them and I tell them, honestly, I completely understand. And I also tell them UPS is hiring. You're more than welcome to go to UPS and get a job. Like, this is the thing. We don't have to do this. We get to do this. Hmm. And part of that getting to do this is the fact that we get to do all the little things that come along with it. Trust me, if you play, like I played ball, I never wanted to go to practice. 
but you have to go to practice. You, people don't want to listen to the coach. You have to listen to the coach. You know, that's how it works. You can't just be like, well, I'm good. So is everybody else. The difference is the most important things, the most important things take no talent whatsoever. Effort, good attitude, willing to learn, showing up, being there, putting in 110%. All those things take no talent. No talent. It takes no talent to die for the ball on the ground. It takes no talent, right? Those are the things that will get you chose over those who get rolled. So just remember that. But so it's up to them. I mean, they're talented. I get it. They'll be very funny at UPS. Yes. A hundred percent facts. Man, I'm, I'm a dancer and a choreographer first. And, you know, I see talented dancers all the time, but that's not the people that I wish to work with. I wish to work with people that show up on time, that are consistent. Exactly. I want to work with people that understand what it is to be able to communicate efficiently, to get a, a job done so we can get the betterment of the project or whatever the case may be. So talent comes. That's the uh, realest thing. But I do think it takes a special formula mixed with talent to really reach that next level of success. Yeah, of course. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have talent. I'm saying talent is amazing. But talent is only 20%. 20%. It's a lot of people. That's why all those same people were like, man, look at that guy. Why does he have what I don't have? Because he was willing to do the things that you weren't willing to do. He was willing and she was willing to put in that work that you weren't willing to put in. That's the little things. And don't look at the outlier of the person who got lucky. Don't look at them. That's the Cinderella story. That's the Cinderella. People always like looking at the outlier and being like, but look, this person didn't do any of that stuff. And they made it. And Cinderella lost her shoe at midnight and, and married a prince. Yes, Cinderella did. But if you lose your shoe at midnight, bitch, you're a whore. Like, let's keep your shoes on. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> keep your shoes on you understand uh shout out to abdullah thank you so much jessica rachel esquire i love it especially coming off of law i understand what you're going through uh shady rap all the way from across the pond in in london doing the thing i appreciate it so much definitely yo shouting out all the peoples thank y'all for tapping in right now we got um homeboy terrell here on black culture to break down so make sure you guys are tapping in and hitting that follow button and staying up to date with everything that we got going on so now one more time how do you pronounce your name one more time tehran 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 i called you tehran tehran all right so now when you every time, by the way, every time you mispronounce my name, it's starting an international incident. I just want you to understand that my name is the capital of Iran. So when people are like, oh, I don't know how to say your name, you're just saying you don't know geography. You know what I'm saying? All right. And you know what? And I'm definitely not going to get that wrong no more. No. Nope. Right. So, Tehran. So now, now moving into like money that's made with comedy for people that want to know. Um, the people that say I got talent and now you know they get opportunities. How long does it actually take to start flourishing in comedy and actually making that money to reach the status of like the Kevin Hart and the Eddie Murphy? Is that a long, easy road or is it a short, easy road? Give us that walk. Well, that's the concept of show business. It's the business part that comes first. And the truth is, you never make money. Kevin Hart's not making money. So when people look at Kevin Hart, I want to explain this to everybody, just like when people look at LeBron James. They look at LeBron James, and he's making $100 million a year, and they're like, oh, how can I make $100 million a year? LeBron James doesn't make $100 million a year. LeBron James and Kevin Hart, they make a percentage of how much they make for someone else. Like, that's the realest thing. Like, they're getting a commission on how valuable they are. And that value takes time, effort, energy, and all that, all that and plus more. So when you're saying, how long is that road? That, long, that road is forever. And if you're looking to make money, this isn't the field to go into. You want to make money? Become a dentist. Become a chiropractor. That person makes money. They'll make a solid amount of money yes. every single year, and, and they'll be fine. This is about the art. This is about the love. And money is just the scoreboard to show you where you are on that track. And it's not the most important part, to be very honest. It's not. So if you're looking to make money, especially quick, fast money, this isn't it. The same way the dope game isn't it. Because as much money as people make in the dope game, they spend a lot longer in jail, right? That's why all the drug dealers you, you know, all the tough drug dealers you know still live in their mom's basements, right? So they still in the basement. Like, if you're making all this money, then why aren't you out in this mansion? Well, no matter what you do, it takes 
heart, effort, energy, and a willingness to do even more. And that, that destiny is why it's not a job. It's not a nine to five. I don't clock in and clock out. That's not how this works. This is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap year. This is how this works. It's a destiny. It's something that I want because I want to be a part of it. And because it's something I want, it's just like when you're drowning, you will do anything to swim to the top to get a breath of fresh air. I will do anything to get to my destiny within reason without compromising myself. Mm -hmm. And that's the truest form. That's the payoff right there is when you get to where you want without compromising your, yourself. And that's when you become Dave Chappelle. That's when you become Michael Jordan or LeBron. That's when you become yes. Tiffany Haddish. You're seeing it happen in front of your eyes. Thanks. Big facts. Um, so once again, a, a whole bunch of gems in that in that piece right there. Um, real quick, who are some of the people that you look up to um, in the game that you know maybe you would love love for your career to be able to reach that or beyond? Or who who are some inspirations for you? Well, my immediate sphere is Maz Jabrani, Max Amini, and Tiffany Haddish. Those are three people in my immediate sphere who have always been amazing to me who've always been there for me, who've guided me, mentored me, and showed me a lot of, a lot of the way. My all-time favorite is Dave Chappelle. Chappelle, to me, regardless of controversy or not, Chappelle is a genius to me, is a genius. Chappelle is a genius. And I would love to be Chappelle, and I would love to be Kevin Hart, and I would love to be, to be all those people, but to be very honest, the person I'm most aspiring to be is simply be myself. I simply aspire to be yeah. myself the way and do it in that Frank Sinatra where it's like, I did it my way, but I did it my way. And that's what I'm most, most looking forward to. Okay. That's why I wear my name on my hat. Okay. People always feel like, why are you wearing your name on your hat or on your shirt, on your chains? All, why do you have some? It's like, and they're wearing Ralph Lauren or Tommy Hilfiger or uh, Louis Vuitton. And I'm like, you do realize that Ralph Lauren is somebody's name. Like Tommy Hilfiger is his nickname. Louis Vuitton, all you need is his social security number. Like you're literally just wearing someone else's name. I'm wearing my name. I'm my own favorite brand. I'm my own favorite team. I'm, I'm going to support me. And I'm hoping other people who say they're my friends are going to support me too. And it's so interesting. And I'm sure you know this. How many of your friends are willing to spend a thousand dollars on a t-shirt from a person who's never done anything for them, but ask you for a free shirt when it's only $10, right? Like, yes, all the time, all the time, all the time. We want favors all the time. And then when it's time to support, it's a, it's a big deal. But then when it's their favorite artists, then, you know, easy, easy. Now, let me ask you this. Um, there's a lot of people I do think that are into now it's a pandemic and people have to find different niches and different things that they love to do that can generate a little bit of income. <laughs> what do you say to people that get depressed over the lack of support by the people that they think are supposed to support them, right? Their friends, their family. And they're like, why are they not supporting? What do you say to those people that can't find the strength to push their forward, their career forward because they're depressed over the lack of support? What it comes down to me, and this is, and shout out to people like uh, Mana in the chat right now and everybody else saying hi. What it comes down to me is this. It makes it very simple, right? Mental health issues aside, depression is a serious, serious matter. But when it comes to depression by rejection, the truth is it should become your motivation. It should become your motivation. The same way yeah. that you're motivated by the girl that said no to you at prom, the same way that you felt motivated by the guy that broke up with you the day before your anniversary, motivate yourself and turn that depression, turn that depression into your greatest impression. Make sure that it's your motivation and your activation to make you get to where you want to go. Use it, funnel it, right? That's the thing, hate is a bad thing only if you hate in a bad way. But if you hate cancer, nobody's like, oh, why do you hate cancer? Hate is such a strong word. That's not how hate works, right? It just hate, use it to motivate, right? Use it to motivate. Use that depression the same way. Use it as, as gasoline in that tank and go. Definitely, man, 100% facts. Yes. And, and, and remember, and hold on, and real quick, I was going to say, and remember the people who weren't there. 
just in my because I'm petty. I'm gonna the first people I'm gonna forget are all the little people. I'm letting you know this now. <laughs> all the little people are the first people I'm gonna forget because I'm gonna make it. With or without you, I'm gonna make it. So the first people group of people I'm forgetting are the little people. So don't be the little person that's left behind. Yeah. Show love now. Definitely. I agree. And then I'm gonna say that if your family and your friends don't wanna add to that, if they don't show you love, don't punish them for it. You just know how to move because everybody, everybody isn't, I'm a choreographer in the dance, like I said, everybody don't want to see dance content. Everybody don't want to see music video content. So I'm not going to punish people for what they don't want to see. Even though I feel like I need y'all to support me, I understand of course. a whole bunch more people in this world that do want to see the content I want to put on. I'm not going to punish you for it, but you will not benefit from it either. No. All right, so... And I'll tell you something, as a choreographer, as a choreographer, people always just think, oh, you're a good dancer. But it's so much more than that. How many hours of practice? People don't realize Lady Gaga broke her hip, not falling down on a ski resort. She broke her hip practicing because she was practicing eight hours a day, even though she didn't have a concert. She was practicing. Choreography is a very difficult art form, dancing, movement. It's not only beautiful to watch, and, it, and the reason why it looks so easy is because people like you make it look so effortless. You're out there popping, and you're like, ah, 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 and we all think, ah, ah, and we all think we can do it, and we cannot. We cannot. Yeah, absolutely. Well, man, definitely. And, and, and I'll, I'll shout out to everybody out there that's a dancer, comedian in, in, in the chat that's trying to push their dreams forward. But just keep grinding. Now, let's let's move it on to to just being black in entertainment. What, what are some of the things that you've recognized just being a black man um, in comedy? Do you, do you feel like you get peripheral treatment? Do you feel like you don't get treated the same? What are your views? What do you mean? Those sirens are for us. They're coming to get us right now, bro. <laughs> they were coming to get us. Yo, yo, Listen. I'm in New York right now. My bad. <laughs> that's how it works. Listen, here, here's, the, here's the idea, right? Being, being black in America is a very unique perspective. That's why it's so difficult for people all over the world to recognize racism, especially from the lens of Western or American life. It's very unique and it's very different and it's extremely oppressive. And once again, you can use that oppression and stay down or you can use that oppression as motivation. And here's the thing, just because some people of color, black men and women go twice as far as everyone else, that doesn't mean that the race was fair. That's simply a testament to how hard they work. They work four times as hard just to go half as far or twice as far. Like they worked harder than what you would have had to work to open those doors. That's why I'm always about support and showing love whenever possible. Shout out to Ashley Michelle in the chat and my boy Kibway who also joined Kimia as well. People who are who are working hard and what they do. But that's the thing. Race is always going to be a hindrance. And even in Hollywood right now where everybody's like, well, look at the diversity. And then you have, uh, you have people of no color, which is what I call white people, people of no color saying, uh, but, but now there's no role for white people. The Hollywood Foreign Press, IMDb, and the data analytics expresses that diversity in Hollywood in totality went from something like 4.5% to 7%. That is it. There is still there is still a 93% for every for all the white people. So they're that upset and people get so mad when diversity and inclusivity become part of the conversation. They're like that's not fair. It's like two things. First of all, first of all, it's not it's unfortunate we have to force the issue and we only have to force the issue because you didn't do it on your own. You didn't do that when you had the chance to do so. How do we know? Because for the last 70 years, nothing was done. So you had 70 years to fix it, you did not. So now that people are speaking up on it, you're upset because to the privileged, equality will always feel like oppression. That's how that works, right? That's how it works. To the privileged, equality will always feel like oppression. And no more do you see that in Hollywood where you see people fighting, whether it's for people of color, whether it's for black people, whether it's for women in Hollywood, because women get treated like crap in Hollywood all the time. And we've known this for so long and never did anything about it. 
whether it's the cats and couch or not equal pay, that's all the stuff that is always going to be something seen as a hindrance. But to me, you take that hindrance and you make it your strength. You make it your strength, you use it as your motivation, and you work twice as hard so you can open the door for the next generation to walk through. So you can be the one complaining, like, look how easy they got it. And that's our way of saying, thank you. When you hear that, just say thank you. When you hear someone complaining, you just say thank you. Thank you, because you made it easier for me. So I'm trying to make it easier for other people. Let's go. Yes! 100% facts. And now, I feel like it definitely has, first of all, black people definitely are the mecca of entertainment to me. Um, oh, hundred! It's not just to you; it's to the world. The black people <laughs> are the trend. Like we couldn't even say king, king and queen for more than six months before everybody started calling each other kings and queens. Like we just got that. We just got that. No, you can't turn on TV. You'll see. You'll see. Uh, uh, you'll see Larry David be like, "That's lit." You know what I'm saying? Like Larry King is saying lit. Like everybody's just using our slang. They're not just jacking our. Flow, they're taking our slang. Absolutely. But then they don't, they, they, they take our culture, but they don't want to wear our pain. You know what I'm saying? Mm. They don't really, they don't really understand that. They want to be able to talk like us, act like us. And that's a question I want to actually get to. Who do you feel is allowed to say the N-word, right? Um, who do you feel like is not allowed to say the N-word? And that's a, a conversation that's going around the clubhouse streets right now. It's all over Twitter. Yeah. Um, and everybody's talking about who is allowed, not allowed to say it. So give us your thoughts on it. I mean, it's actually very simple for me. I believe in things like free speech. I think everybody's allowed to say the N-word. Everybody is allowed to say the N-word. It's just don't get mad when you get punched in the face. Like, don't be surprised. When, like, the consequence, people forget the consequences. of free. They just want the free speech. They forget the consequence. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. here's the thing. Everybody is allowed to say the N-word. I want people around me that don't want to, that understand enough not to. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I don't see people rushing to use other racial slurs. Nobody's out there trying to say chink or spick. Nobody's fighting for those rights. But when it comes to black people, because we do things so trendy and well, everybody wants to do what we do. So everybody's out there saying, oh, I need to say the N word. How come if everybody else, if you're saying it so much, how come I can't say it? And I explain it. Not only is there a history of negativity and a connotation of oppression that comes with the n-word it's the right of the victim to reclaim victimhood in any way that they find and are able to do so any way they're able to do so that is the right of the person who's victimized and that's what is the truth regardless of how you want to place it or frame it black culture black people were victimized by history in the united states and still continue to be so even though it's not as much as a hundred years ago or 200 years ago, it still exists. Basic. Exactly. In a microaggressive way. So what I'm expressing is not only is that all there, but it's also a word you shouldn't want to use. And I explain this to people all the time. It's like, it's like if I have a girlfriend, if I have a girlfriend and I call her baby, right? That's a word that her and I use because we're intimate and familiar with each other. But if another random person came up and started calling her baby, I might want to fight that guy, right? That would be disrespectful. Yes. It would be inappropriate. Everybody understands that. That's what the, the word nigga is for black people. It's a sense of familiarity and intimacy yeah. between black community. It's, it's a word that we use to express our understanding of each other's situations. So when other people want to come use it, it's like you're calling my girl baby, and that's not okay. You shouldn't want to do that. You should understand why that's disrespectful. Absolutely. And just like girls can call each other bitches, and that's like an endearing thing, like that's my bitch. But if we were to say that to a girl and said that's my bitch, we would get attacked <laughs> because they will feel like we disrespect them. So it, because it's, it's two different contexts, and we are not allowed to say that in that way, just like white people shouldn't be calling black people the n-word in any that's the thing i don't want to live in a world where you're not allowed to say the n-word i want to live in a world where like white people aren't allowed to say the n-word i want to live in a world where white people don't want to say the n-word there's a difference i want who don't want to they understand and they understand enough to know that they don't want to do it they understand enough that they don't want to add to it and instead of telling black people what they need to do and what we need to do 
what they should be focused on is what should they do or what can they do to fix it? See, that's the thing. That's the problem with racism. People, especially in the white community, they look at, at racism as a problem that black people go through and they need to empathize with. But the truth is, it's a problem that white people have that they need to fix. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going through it because of you. So you just need to fix this problem. This isn't something you need to empathize with me on at all. You need to fix what's wrong with you and your people. You know what I'm saying? So that we can be our people. So we can all be one people. You have to fix that part to get to this. That's the same thing in any relationship. It'd be the same thing. Absolutely. You know? And, and, and I definitely think the log is important. A lot of times if we don't have these conversations then we don't know what's acceptable, what's appropriate and what's not. And, and, and definitely keep, challenge, keep challenging yourselves um, for people listening out there and just definitely have these conversations on, on, like you said, not being allowed to, but just wanting to. That's a self, a self declaration thing that you know i'm gonna know that that's the wrong thing to do and i'm not gonna do it but yo nowadays everybody's on demon time everybody want to fight turn up they want to rage so that's what they want to do so the, the last of the mohicans is definitely running out uh so what do you say to the next generation um of of comedians you know actors and people coming up that definitely don't have Jesus in their heart uh, <laughs> or just a good soul. What do you guys say about that? My thing is, it's simple. Don't treat others as bad as they are. Treat others as good as you are. So you should always maintain that goodness within you. You should always have a good mind, a good heart and, and a good spirit. And so in Farsi, there's actually a, a, an extremely ancient philosophy of life which is the basis of all monotheistic religions through Zoroastrianism, which is Ker Darinik, Pen Darinik, Gof Darinik, which is like good thoughts, good words, good deeds. And that should be just the way that we should all express ourselves for ourselves, not for others, but for ourselves. It just makes life a lot better. Definitely, definitely makes life a lot better. Um, man, you definitely, yo, if y'all tapping in today and y'all ain't catch no gems and he giving away for free, <laughs> then you on the wrong line, right? But here on Black yeah. Home, we definitely like to break everything down. And we, we, we got into comedy and, and, and definitely Black men in comedy and, and entertainment. And, and, and now I want to get into some real life topics that's happening right now in the world today. Um, let's start with this, this, this crazy news. Um, uh, forty-one-year-old Virgil Abula, artistic director. Of Ablo, Virgil Ablo. Lord have yeah. mercy. Virgil Ablo. Uh, yeah. Artistic director of Louis Vuitton and Off White passed away. Um, yeah. Do you? What are your thoughts on on, on that tragic story? At, at the age of forty-one, I mean, Virgil Ablo was a trendsetter, a tastemaker, ahead of his time. This was a person who merged culture and is a person who is a leader and pioneer in the fashion industry, period, in respite of the fact that he's also an African-American. Virgil Abloh passing away, it, it affected me personally a lot because I've always been working hard to become successful, and I wanted to be successful, so I'd be so successful that Virgil Abloh would give me stuff. Because that's what all the rappers talk about, is how Virgil gives them stuff. And now he's dead. Like, I will never get free stuff from Virgil Abloh. Like, I, could he not wait? Could he not live until, until I made it? You know, it's just another one of those, another one of those situations where it's like, oh, not another one. But yeah, the, when they say the good die young, they mean it. Definitely. Definitely, it's super, super sad. And man, this year is just crazy. We've been losing a lot of legends from DMX to, you know, to Michael uh, K. Um, come on, to, to now Virgil. It's just, it, the, the, the list goes on and on and on. And it, it feels like we're losing a lot of our legends, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and people that just put quality work down. Young Dolph, uh, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's getting crazy. What, what do you think about, let's say, entertainment death kind of taking more of, of a rise? I feel like death is more prominent now than it was maybe a little bit further back. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, first of all, Anna, Anna Quinzel didn't know that DMX died. She, that's my Harley Quinn, and she didn't know, so I don't know what to tell her. Um, 
And DMX was actually a very, was one of the people who gave me a, a very early start in life. So shout out to DMX for real. And I mean that. Uh, as far as legends dying, the reason why we noticed legends dying to begin with is because they left a mark. They left a mark on our history, on our, on our television sets, in our hearts. So the fact that we even notice it is simply because, because the number of legends have gone up. There was a time where there were, only, there were only five people that were famous in the whole world. Then that number doubled every year, and now there's a lot. And, and a lot of people get very frustrated by that, and I, I myself don't. I myself don't at all because I tell people, who, those who try to stop others from becoming legends, remember, when you're walking at night and you look up at the night and it's full of, and, and there's only like one or two stars, you never look up again. It's only when you look up at the night sky and it's full of stars that you look up in awe and go, wow, this is so beautiful. That's how it can be for us to be stars. There's so many legends, and we've noticed them even more now. There are so many legends, whether it's DMX or Young Dolph or Virgil Abloh and more. So we've noticed and taken notice but the whole concept is, once again, let that motivate you to leave your mark so people will notice when you're gone because that's all we really have as far as legacy and, and immortality is what do you do for the people around you? Now, that doesn't mean you have to be famous. It literally just means that you have to positively affect the people around you. And how many people actually do that on a daily basis? If that doesn't include you, then you're not the solution. You're part of the problem. <laughs> 100% facts. Yep, sound effect. Yeah. 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 And when I die, when I die, I hope people better, listen, when I see people cry for people they didn't know, I'm like, when I die, you need to stab your eye. Like, I need you to show me you care. Like, don't, don't, cry for, don't cry for Virgil and you never met Virgil a day in your life. And then when I die and I loaned you $200 the, the other week, be happy that you don't have to pay me back. You better cry the same if not 10 times the amount of tears. That's how I feel about all my fam family and friends. I'm letting them all, all know that right now. Yeah, it's so funny. You say you better stab your eye out when you die. Wait, you better be I so hurt. Oh, man, well, hopefully that will be a long time from now. You got a lot more to put down. Well, I don't want it to be too long from now. You understand what I'm saying? Because if we're looking at legends dying young then i don't want to live old and then be like man i never did nothing like like in a reasonable time a reasonable time you know i don't want to be tupac good so what's the reasonable time uh for me i think the reasonable time would be you know what doesn't look cool what being 85 just doesn't look cool to me you understand what i'm saying for those who it do it cool. i have it look cool on hugh hefner yeah, exactly. You got to be Hugh Hefner. I'm not Hugh Hefner. You understand? I'm already, I'm already, I'm already like young old. Like I'm young old. Like I feel, so I, I'm not going to be a great 85 year old. Shout out to everybody who's 85 and up and they're out there being live and active. I love that. I, I, to me, that's more, that's more fulfilling than when I see love, young people out in the streets. Like you're young, you're supposed to be doing stuff it's when i see older people when i see the betty whites of the world you know people don't realize that oprah near 70 like doing thing Whoopi goldberg like i'm looking at them like those are my heroes mm -hmm. they are my heroes these people in these streets but everybody older is old as the new young now man like yo think about it. we're gonna have grandparents with tattoos on their faces and stuff now yeah Everyone's going to have a, a young vibrance to them. People got BBLs out here. Grandma's got BBLs. Like, so it's, it's different. But I'm curious to see what the next 20 years is going to look like projected and what the next generation of grandmas is going to look like. In case, yeah. we're going gonna to start having um. A oh, it's going to be very different. It's going to be very different. Remember, okay, when we were kids, people used to get in a, a fights. They'd be like, your mom's a hoe. And then someone would be like, nah, your mom's a hoe. And people used to, you know, in the future, they'd be like, your mom's a hoe. And someone would be like, no, she's not. And they'd be like, yeah, she is. I went back her Instagram, look at her twerk queen, <laughs> twerk queen 2021, right there. Look at her twerk. Oh, look at that gif. That's a gif of her twerking. That is a gif of her twerking. That's a real thing. Would you would you really want to smack somebody for pulling out a receipt on your mom? Like, Yo, what is your comeback when somebody has a receipt? What's your comeback? A receipt? What do you say to that? You have to just be like, yeah, well, um, just let it. You have to just walk that. You you just have to let that happen. 
You know what I'm saying? You just have to let that happen. You just have to hope he doesn't know who his daddy is. Like you need, <laughs> you need something more on, you just have to hope like he has Parkinson's or something. Like you need something bad and dramatic to go at him for, you know? Definitely, definitely. I, I got a couple more questions for you. Okay, a couple more questions? Yes, sir. Okay, um, so and let's talk about this real quick. Um, Thanksgiving just passed. Lighten up the mood. How long do you keep your leftovers before you have to throw it away? This is a long debate. Some people saying two days. Some people saying two five days is too long. How long? So here's the thing. Is this me personally or the average person? Well, you know what? Let's go with you personally and then if the average person is different. Okay. So here, here's the thing. I'm going to say unpopular opinion. I don't like leftovers. So I don't eat leftovers. My leftovers are gone. If I'm taking food from the restaurant, I'm giving it to the homeless. I'm not eating it myself. I just don't eat leftovers. I barely eat food to begin with. However, for the average person, you eat as long as it's a treat. When I don't like it is when people are eating leftovers a week later, like, oh, stupid turkey. Then why'd you cook so much? Like, who were you cooking for? Like if you're if you hate the food you're eating, then you need to you need to do something else. Okay, so you said unpopular opinion. I don't like leftovers. Yeah, no. I do not like leftovers. Man, I hate leftovers too. You know, I, yeah. I, I like to eat fresh food every day. I'm sorry. fresh food. That's how I roll. Like I get it. You know, that's how you I'm do. lucky enough to do so, and I'm fortunate enough to do so. And I thank I thank the universe every day. I thank the universe every day that I'm fortunate enough to do so. And still, um, that's what I'm doing, you know? Definitely. So what are you watching on Netflix? There's a lot of good content right now on Netflix. Halle Berry just dropped Bruised. And um, there's so many different uh, movies. Did you watch Squid Games? What are you watching on Netflix? So I just finished a Narcos Mexico marathon, okay? Didn't sleep for 24 hours as I went through Narcos Mexico just to catch up for the new season. So I'm very happy with Narcos. Uh, I, but I watch, to be very honest, I watch TV like a 14-year-old girl. I watch things like Gossip Girl. I'm, I'm watching on HBO Max, uh, on HBO Max Sex Lives of College Girls. I think that show is popping. I'm, I'm watching, I watch Riverdale. Like, don't judge me, okay? Don't judge me. Okay, there ain't nothing wrong with those. I, I watched the first rendition of Gossip Girl. I saw on HBO Max, they have a new... They, they, a new yeah. Thing. They brought it back. Is it good? Yes. Is that what you asked me? Is yeah. it good? Yeah. It, it is? No comment. No comment. It's not, it's not unbearable. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Dang, so are you saying it's my time watching it? I'm just saying that... You know, I think they're, the, the actors in it are very attractive. Very attractive people in the show. Okay. Yes. Now, I, I don't have anything else. I watch, but I watch things like Sabrina and Lucifer and every, I like, I really watch shows like that. I'm, I'm, ho I'm waiting for the new Top Boy to come out. Hopefully that comes out. I had a British accent for like two months because of Top Boy. I was walking around like, what's up, bro? Roadman. I run, I run the mandem. Like I was living that life for like two months because of Top Boy, you know? Okay. So, and, and then um, Idris Alba and them have a new uh, limited series movie that came out on Netflix that I've heard is amazing. And I'm going to watch that. And the Kevin Hart, Wesley Snipes uh, yeah. show. I heard great things about that. So I'm going to definitely check those out. And then um, uh, Jay-Z's joint. Exactly. So it's a, there's a lot of good TV. What I try not to do is become inundated with TV because if you go down that rabbit hole, next thing you know, it's December. And that's what I felt like happened this year. You know, exactly. Coming at you, too much content. But I guess they do it because all the family members are here. I guess if content creators pay attention to what the greats are doing. They drop a lot of content around this time, Thanksgiving time. So people must be home watching TV. Uh, 100%. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So it's just, it's just interesting to see how everybody moves because uh, music is scarce right now, but it's heavy on the Netflix and HBOs and Hulus right now. Heavy. Definitely. Let's, let, let's move into music as a last question. Um, Halle Berry said that Cardi B is the queen of hip hop. What are your thoughts on that statement? Do you think that Cardi B gets to wear that crown? That's actually, Halle Berry saying that actually is a great statement. It just lets me know that Halle Berry 
doesn't listen to hip hop and that's okay. <laughs> like it's okay that she doesn't listen to hip hop. You understand? I, I mean, listen, Cardi B is definitely in the Royal court of, of female hip hop aficionados. She has left her mark regardless of what you think. Bodak yellow was a hit. Cardi B as, as an entity herself is amazing. But if we're looking at works of art, I would say that there are more, deserving queens of hip hop that have reigned, whether it's Little Kim or Lauren Hill, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Foxy Brown. I mean, there's a royal court, but there's also another thing when it comes to hip hop, we always think of it like a zero sum game in black culture where it's like, I can only win if you lose. And why can't we all just win? Why can't Cardi B be a, a queen of hip hop? alongside the other queens of hip hop, the same way that Jay-Z is a king of hip hop alongside the other kings. And we recognize each for their contribution and individual distribution. Like, I feel like we need to stop that competitive nature where it's I win only if you lose and you can win if I lose. We can all win. Like, we can all really win. Definitely. But in this case, Halle Berry did not win this argument. Absolutely <laughs> not. Nope. Um, yeah. That question was asked to Remy Ma, um, you know, what do you think about the whole queen of hip hop title? And she said exactly the same thing. Like she said, in the real world, there's multiple kings. There's the king of England, mm. England. there's the, the king of Scotland, the prince of Wales. There's different, there's different rulers all across different lands. So why exactly different kings and queens in the same genre, just in different territories. You know what I'm saying? Sh shout out to Dana Keel, who says we can all eat. And also, I'm so glad Remy Ma gave that answer because if Remy Ma had said herself, I would have just quit. I would have quit. If Remy Ma had said her own name, I would have been like... <laughs> Well, but but she said that everybody in hip-hop needed to say that they're the queen of hip-hop. That's what you're supposed to do. So... Yeah. Uh, so I can see that. I can see that. But you, you should always knew, know the truth within yourself. So here are the things. There are many contributing factors. And one thing Cardi B has done, she's definitely contributed a lot to the personality of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Right. But if I, if I was asking today, I think Megan the Stallion would have a conversation for who it is right now. There's always someone who's hot today. And just because you're hot today doesn't mean you were hot yesterday. And it definitely doesn't mean you'll be hot again tomorrow. So you're only as good as your last hit in no matter what avenue, revenue, or stream that you are in, whether it's in a management position at Walmart or dropping your next LP. You're only as good as your last hit. So don't ride a wave too long. Keep making waves. Well, if that's the case, then Doja Cat will be the queen of hip hop right now because, you know, she got mad songs on Billboard and she's on top of her game. Her album is still selling a whole, a whole bunch of millions. So shout out to all the ladies in hip hop. But Halle Berry. Does Doja Cat do hip hop, though? Doja Cat is pop. She's pop. But she be rapping. I feel like she's. Uh, is she? Doja Cat uh, raps. Nicki, Nicki Minaj birthed a, a next generation of artists that. Sure. Have crossover appeal that can do pop and hip hop as they should as they should however doja cat raps like a white person who heard from someone else what rap is supposed to sound like and then she raps like that and i love doja cat and what she does and who she is and let's be real i would wipe doja cat in a heartbeat but when it comes to her rapping that's not what it is lauren hill was a rapper who also did it her way those songs clearly had a strong Lauryn Hill influence, whether it's the sound or the words or the content and the context. That's the kind of stuff that I'm looking for when it comes to rap. There's something that rap has in, in commonality with comedy, and it comes down to one thing, authenticity. Yeah. It needs to be authentic. It's the most sincere form of art, which is why hip hop, like comedy, is the is the for the people it's for the masses yeah. I, I completely agree but i feel like rap now is such a loose term that i feel like lauren hill isn't a rapper she's more like an mc uh, a lyricist uh, a poet and she's so much deeper than a rapper now i feel like the word rap is just such a common now term that i don't even want to put her in that category does that make sense I 
But that's the thing. You know, a lot of artists keep looking down on rap because it sounds so, so exclusive and it sounds like it excludes. It's a box. And they love, and by they, I mean the general public. I mean, uh, I, I mean the white patriarchy. They love putting, especially people of color and black people in boxes. That's why you see a lot of rap artists who are offended by the term rapper because rapper is the new term for nigger. If you listen to it, sometimes they'll be like, rapper Young Dolph was, you could have just said music artist Young Dolph, but you had to say rapper because you're basically saying nigger Young Dolph was shot. You know, that's really what they're doing in Memphis. Like they're really doing it that way. And you can feel it. You can feel it. That's why that's why sometimes people don't want to be in the box. But you know what? I love the one thing I love about hip hop is the inclusivity. Mm -hmm. It's so inclusive. It welcomes everybody from all walks of life. You can be rich and white. You can be young, poor and Latino. It welcomes everybody and has a message for everybody. That's the beauty of black culture is that as exclusive as other people like to be, they are not as inclusive as we have always had to be. Man, it's completely true, man. I agree with you in 100% facts, man. You dropped so many gems tonight. And My you, dude. You, you know, I know you probably was like, Ooh, we, we took it all the way to some, some, some deep conversations. But, you know, I wanted people to really get to, to, to know that, that side of the business and, and what it really takes to be a comedian because I've been, you know, watching what you've been doing and it's dope. Um, to see that you out here really hustling, you know, and putting on for black people too, because I know you you heavy on the black power, and, and I appreciate that. Um, so let everybody know what you got coming on next, and that we should be on the lookout for. Well, I'm at the Laugh Factory right here in West Hollywood on Sunset. Every single Thursday is the Tehran Show. It's the most fun night at the Laugh Factory. Everybody comes through, so make sure to come through to be a part of greatness. I enjoy you. I'm also touring, whether it's with Maz Jabrani or on my own. So make sure to stay in, uh, stay up with all the cities that I'm going to be in. I'm allowed back in Canada now, so I'm going to Canada. We're different now. I'm different, you know? And I'm trying to catch up with you. When next time I come to New York, I'm trying to catch up to you and learn how to pop. I'm going to learn some. I'm going to be like, uh, 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 uh. I'm doing all of it. Yo, man, we could put content together all that. I'm down, bro. Whenever you get to New York, definitely link with us. Yeah, please. And shout out to all the people in the chat who kept it live. Uh, for the people who asked me if I'm single, I'm married to the streets. Yes, I'm very single. Shout out, Kay. Thank you so much. You are my sister. I love you. Canada represent. Uh, shout out to Isabel, who's been extremely supportive. And my message to the Persian people and just just to shout out some Farsi because I always show Persian love. Salam bedustana aziz durud farawan bar hamen shama. Man Tehran astam yeh na un Tehran bar ke hamin Tehran ke jolotun nishaste. Vai har shama am basham Tehran. Azin Tehran to un Tehran shab uruz hamigi bechir. So thank you so much for having me on. By the way, in case you're wondering what I said, I just planned the next attack. You will never know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's why comedy, comedy, especially mine, is the medicine that helps the sugar go down. So keep, keep taking the truth. Keep being part of the truth. That's what we are, is the truth. Definitely. We are 100% nothing but the truth. Man, Teron, you were dope. And again, you ain't going to be a stranger. We'll definitely have you back on whenever you got anything to promote. Please don't be a stranger on the show, my brother. I appreciate it. You know, you already know what it is. Of course, man. Thank I you for keeping up for black culture, my dude. Thank you for doing what you do. Of course, man. Whenever I'm in LA, we'll definitely link. And I'll yeah, for sure. All right, man. So it was nice having you on, and we'll talk soon. Yes, sir. All right. So everybody, that was the legend, Teron. We're going to definitely call him a legend already. All right? And we're going to definitely make sure we tap in with him. Follow, like, and subscribe to his YouTube channel. I know he got one. All right? Make sure y'all go ahead and follow me. It's free. <laughs> I also have a YouTube channel. Subscribe. <laughs> All right, y'all. I'm out of here. I'm super tired. I appreciate all the love. I appreciate that y'all tap in. Black Culture to Breakdown is every Sunday, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on my Instagram Live. But today we're here on Monday doing a revival. 
All right, Teron officially just left. But I do do this show very frequently. I have a whole bunch of people. Raz B from B2K was on last week. Um, come on, I had James DuBose, CEO and um, general manager of Fox Soul, who's been on. Jason Lee from Hollywood Unlock. So a lot of people come on, and we definitely tap it with Black Excellence. So again, I am your boy, Jersey. Hit the follow button.